You're all very welcome today to this subscriber speaker guest event hosted by 42 Courses with our guest, Jules Goddard. We are absolutely honoured to be joined by such a legend with such an amazing career us on in New York back in the day in Ogilvy. I'm sure he has many stories to tell of the early days. He spent time in France, working in France. And whilst he was working on his doctoral thesis, and then came to the London Business School, where he is now a fellow and very much part of the makeup of the university, and also is on the Academic Council of European Centre for Executive Development at NSAID. I mean, really a fantastic career. And we are, as I say, honoured to have you join us today, Jules. Thank you, Louise. I wish I were a legend, but let's pretend the next <laughs> You're a legend to us, Jules. <laughs> so Jules is also the author of several books, most recently Mavericks. How Bold Leadership Changes the World. He wrote that with David Lewis. And of course, Jules is a guest speaker in our course for 42 Courses, Creative Leadership. But let's go back now, uh, Jules, and the book that I mentioned, Mavericks, which is very much uh, a passion subject for you. Tell us how you came first of all I've said about your journey tell us in your own words a bit more about your journey and then how this leads into your most recent book that you wrote thank you Louise and and lovely to be with you all thank you for joining us um yes I started life I guess my working life in Ogilvy I got to know David Ogilvy very well and when he moved when he retired and moved to France to this beautiful uh, chateau on the Loire. I lived at the, in those days in the Dordogne, just about 100 miles south. So I would often drive up and, 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 and meet him and his wife and talk about life and so on. And I learned an enormous amount from David Ogilvy. He was passionate about um, writing as one would speak, uh, writing readably. I remember the day I arrived to work in his offices. I think there were three books on my desk awaiting me. One was, of course, David Ogilvy's uh, Confessions of an Advertising Man. It's a wonderful book, of course, one of the finest books ever written on marketing, I think. But also The Golden Book of Writing. It was by a Dartmouth professor on principles of, of writing in a highly readable manner. And actually, David would spend quite a bit of the day simply uh, intervening in communications between different people within the agency and with a blue pencil, literally, changing the memos between you know the creative department and the accounts group making them more lead more readable more 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 beautifully written and so on and then there was another book called obvious adams which was a uh, an article from the new yorker if i remember rightly which in 1924 and obvious adams was rather like that peter sellers character do you remember he seemed stupid or extra, exceptionally naive, but always had the answer to quite complex problems. And Ogilvy always believed that the right answer was one you'd wished you'd thought of, if only you gave your permission to be quite simple. And uh, those three books had a huge influence on me. Uh, later in my life, I returned to, to France to have a place in Provence, which is very nice. But um, Mavericks was really, very briefly, Mavericks, David Ogilvy was a maverick. Uh, I've moved uh, with, around with many, many mavericks in my life. In fact, we're all mavericks deep down. It's the child within us, I think. It's the, it's the playful person within us who needs to find expression in life, both at work and in the family and in life generally, I think. And I wanted to feature mavericks as a kind of style of leadership that didn't entail followership. Because I've always worried about those who take the stance of following others in life. I think it's quite unhealthy. And I think when business schools specialize as they do 
on leadership. That too is slightly unhealthy because most models of leadership entail followership. And life is not about following others. I think life is about making one's own life, if you see what I mean. I do. That's quite a strong statement, Jules. And there is very much a follower culture uh, these days with obviously the huge growth in both social media and influences. And uh, we don't, I think, feel any shame in saying, oh, I follow such and such. And you feel it's because you're, you know, getting the wisdom or being able to see their words. But you see a little bit of a uh, a challenge in that. It's a very good, it's a very well put question. I'm, I naturally always have been, I've had lots of heroes in life, many of them philosophers, some of them scientists, and because my father was a painter, many of them painters, and I always fell victim slightly of hero worship, and there's a, there's a danger there, isn't there, that, that in, in awe of others, we feel unable to construct a life of our own that has mm -hmm. heroic elements and so on. And of course, it's important to follow uh, ideas. I think thought leaders are very interesting. Those who lay down a pattern of thinking that's extremely liberating. Why shouldn't we follow uh, such leaders, such, such thought leaders? Uh, I suppose it's really an element of servitude that I'm fearful mm -hmm. of or leading a passive life rather than an active life uh, and being too easily taken in, particularly in the workplace, finding oneself at the receiving end of instructions, uh, required to comply. And of course, philosophically, this is dangerous because the workplace can be a place where instrumental values dominate. In other words, people are treated as means rather than ends, as means to the company's success rather than ends in their own right. And I suppose that's, in a sense, the Kantian notion of, of treating others as ends it is the origin of my fear about excessive followership, if I can put it that way, Louise. Yes, and you mentioned as well earlier the importance of play, of remaining playful. And of course, you are the host of the School of Uncommon Sense. And I know when we chatted earlier, we talked about how uh, Rory, Rory Sutherland, had yeah. said himself very much that he's almost feared for the lack of humour in <laughs> the workplace today. Uh, how do you feel about that, Jules? I think it's, again, it's a very well put question. Rory is one of my heroes, so I'm a follower of Rory. <laughs> I think um, we all are. <laughs> he's not only a wonderful thinker, I think he's a wonderful person. I think he has huge humility. I mean, I know he loves talking and he's full of ideas, uh, but he, he is exceptionally gifted. And I think Rory would agree with me that the workplace needs to be more playful. We tend to think of work as toil as a kind of duty, uh, perhaps as a way of earning our living, rather than a place where we make a life as opposed to making a livelihood. And I think that's a bit dangerous. I think that the contrast between workers' toil and workers' play is quite an important one. I, I lead a, a philosophy program in Fontainebleau, and I was working the other day with Alain uh, André Comte-Sponville, I suppose, the most distinguished French philosopher, and he asked us all, if you were not paid to go to work, would you still go to work? Or better put, if we were independently wealthy, would we still choose to go to work, to spend time with colleagues doing what we do for the customers that we serve? And I think if the answer is no, then there's something severely wrong with the workplace. If it feels like a punishment rather than a joy, if we put it that way, something's wrong. And I think a very interesting principle of management should be to, to design the workplace such that it's so pleasurable, uh, it's such fun to be there, uh, it's so intrinsically motivating that even if you weren't paid, assuming the money was coming from elsewhere, we would still work with the colleagues we have doing something like 
the work that we're already doing. And that would be such a compliment to a workplace if it were designed like that. But very few workplaces live up to that standard. And I think as a result are not, if I can put it this way, as wealth creating as those that uh, are, um, you know, genuinely playful. It's so pertinent in the huge discussion at the moment about the return to office. And earlier on with me, you were alluding to this balance of the employees and the employers and that it shouldn't be the place the employer's place that the employees come to in a way you're sort of saying the power is with the employees yes i think so i i'm thinking of writing a book with the following title from human resources to resourceful humans um and i'm slightly fearful of the notion of employment itself i we uh, are expected to apologize for many things that our ancestors did, particularly the British Empire, and particularly our connection with slavery. And the question that I pose in my own mind is what will our descendants be apologizing for on our behalf? What are we doing today that would seem to be morally upright and perfectly straightforward and fair? but which in the future we will realize to be, you know, hugely morally compromised. And I think one thought may be the notion of employment. Uh, I'm not sure that it's right for there to be employers and employees rather than co-owners of the same business. There may be some who have a much greater stake in the firm than others. But I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable when some of us are placed in the condition of being more dependent upon others than they are upon us, because that can lead to a sense of victimhood, a sense of failure in life, and so on. And the one thing we owe one another is this, this treatment in such a way that we are all the beneficiaries of our relationship. Uh, we do not work for the company. The, the company works for us. If we say we're working for the company, then the company has been reified, to use a philosophical expression, that that becomes the end, and we are merely the instrumental means for the company's success. I think that's very unhealthy. I think the right way to think is that companies are very useful because they bring us all together so that we can achieve our own purposes and aims better than we could do otherwise, because we're working with others who are pursuing, who are pursuing their aims and purposes in their life. In other words, collectively, we're achieving something much, much more than we could ever achieve separately. And therefore the company, the organization becomes the means to that mutual and reciprocal success, if I can put it that way. It seems on the face of it, such a, a radical idea and then when you just reflect of course it's a very sort of socialist cooperative idea as old as the hills it's fascinating to hear you speak about that and it's um talking about the employees it's reminding me of a part of the the creative leadership course when you talk about a particular project that one particular company had where they drew on the employees to bring in other members oh, yes. of staff with a reward. Would you mind just sharing that story, George? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm allowed, I think, to mention it. It happened so long ago, Louis, <laughs> I'm allowed to mention it. Unilever um, was one of my main clients when I was very young. Um, and they were very concerned in those days about whether they were recruiting you know, the very best out of our top universities. I suspect they were, by the way, they had an immense draw. They probably still do. But in those days, it was one of those companies that graduates of uh, top universities wanted to work for. But they thought they could do better still. And one of the ideas I hatched, which they put into practice for a while, I don't know for how long, was to offer, let's say, a Cambridge student a place on condition that that student 
could amongst his colleagues and associates find another student whom he thought Cambridge would, uh, Unilever would really, really benefit from. In other words, we all know when we're students who the really bright ones are, don't we? And therefore we'll know whom Unilever should, if they could be recruiting, if only they had our knowledge. So the deal was bring in another person. Uh, obviously the other person would have to agree. And then your salary the first three years was dependent at least in part upon the success of the person you brought into Cambridge. And that was quite a clever way of tapping into the wisdom of the recruiting class from that university, if you see what I mean. I hope I've explained it. <laughs> yes, very much so. And I, I love the idea of the experimentation of that. It's a great fan of behavioral science. I'm yeah. a great fan as well, of course, of experimentation. I know that as a concept is something that you are very much interested in. Yes. I I share one story as to why I think it's important. I think ideas can be distributed across a normal distribution. There's a whole lot of ideas in the middle that are sensible. Let's call them common sense, general practice, the right way to do things, how it's always been done and so on. But business has a moral imperative to leave the common sense and move in a rather riskier fashion outside the bounds of good sense to take the risk to do things differently, to pioneer better ways of doing things. Hence, you know, the very progressive quality that markets have. The problem is that when you move outside of that middle band, you can either move to the right to a brilliant idea or to the left to a genuinely stupid idea. The problem is that our minds are not very good at separating between the brilliant and the stupid if they haven't been tried, because many of the greatest scientific breakthroughs originated as potentially foolish ideas. The Darwinian notion that we're the descendants of bacteria must be one of the silliest <laughs> ideas man has ever conceived. It just happens probably to be true. So we need experimentation to separate the risky ideas that are true, helpful, effective, from those ideas that are stupid and regressive and unhelpful and wealth destroying, because our minds, without trying them out, our minds can never tell the difference. And experimentation allows nature or reality to make those choices, given a beautifully designed experiment. And we do not therefore depend upon experts or leaders who are probably not very gifted at knowing in the future what will work or what will not work. So that's where I see the origins of the power of experimentation in business. It's the more scientific way of making decisions, of course. Mm, I, I like that description. It makes me think that it's almost uh, re to refer to uh, Nazim Nicholas Taylor. It's like the, the good ideas are actually the, the black swans. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And black swans can't be, so to speak, easily predicted or easily understood. They take us by surprise. And... Aren't we lucky as human beings that we, we can recognize the unexpected? Because when the world takes us by surprise, the world is telling us that something in our makeup, in our assumption set has let us down. We expected X, but Y happened. So what was the flawed assumption that led us to believe in X rather than Y? So it's a signal that we're mistaken, that we're fallible creatures. And therefore, we need to explore which assumptions we should discard and perhaps which new assumptions we should try out. And I mean, of course, you, as I referred to earlier, you have a wealth of experience and must have seen great changes, you know, in fashion, out of fashion. When we're talking about the subject of creative leadership, do you see leadership as having improved I mean, we all know there are vast improvements coming building equality diversity but then you refer back obviously with huge respect as we all do the way yeah. that David Ogilvy ran the firm and your yeah. learnings from him so I suppose um what I'm really asking is you know we we 
like to think we've moved forward, but have we? Have, do you think we have moved forward? I want to say yes. I'm an optimist. I believe the world is getting better on most dimensions. But there is a crisis of, of confidence, I think, in our leaders, uh, in Europe in particular at the moment, whether in the public uh, sphere and politics and so on, and in the private sphere. And when we lose confidence, when we're slightly fearful of the future, all sorts of things are lost to humanity. I like Kenneth Clark's definition of civilization. You're all too <laughs> young to remember the wonderful series he made on civilization. But the end uh, of describing, you know, 10 centuries of civilization, he asked himself, you know, how would I define civilization? He's standing on the left bank of the Seine, looking across the river to Notre Dame. And he looks at the cathedral and he says, civilization, if it is to be distilled into a single word, is confidence. And I'm not sure that we have the confidence we need at the moment. We find we're very good at finding fault in things. We're very good at pointing out where things are not working. Um, but we're not very good at envisioning a better, more hopeful future, I think. I think it's probably true of the States as well. I was educated in the States. And uh, one of the things I discovered, I mean, I was very young. I was in my early 20s and so on. And it was very contagious, the, the wonderful confidence that Americans had in, in, in the 60s. I mean, it was a difficult decade. I was there when RFK was shot. I was there when Martin Luther King was killed. Uh, it was a difficult decade. But on the other hand, beneath that surface of, of, of crisis and tragedy, there was a huge self-belief and a huge confidence in the future. And I think it, even in America, I don't know whether you'll agree, pick it, pick it up in the conversation, we'll have it a moment or two. But I have a feeling that, that leaders don't quite feel as on top of things or don't quite feel that they have the right to be experimental, to try things out, to make mistakes, to, in a sense, bump into success, to lead a rather more serendipitous life, acting on the world to discover what needs to be thought rather than thinking about things to do in order to decide what to do. It's very the American principle of pragmatism, do in order to think more clearly rather than think in order to act more rationally. I think it, it, that side of things may, may be weakening. Yes, there's certainly uh, a challenge on with our current leaders and as you say without uh, going deep into politics now there appears to be a large degree of mistrust of the people who should as you say be leading us and in those departments we aren't seeing very creative leadership but I don't think we're going to necessarily put the world to rights in that department <laughs> no we're not <laughs> So um, what I'd like to do is um, Chris, our eminent founder, who we would all work for for free, um, has put a couple of questions in the chat. So I would really like him to join us and, <clears throat> excuse me, put a couple of his questions to you. So if you would like to join us there, Chris, you're very welcome. Oh, so Jules, what, a, what an honour. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, can do go ahead. Marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> yeah, we we um I'm here with Jake as well. I don't know whether you can see us. But, um, <laughs> so Hello, hi. Jake. Hi, Jake. <laughs> How are you? Very, very well. And um, yeah, we we were just uh, we were chatting while you were talking um, uh, about some of the things you were talking about. Well, one of the things we were wondering is you, you were you mentioned Rory and and David as as two heroes. Who who are some of your other heroes? Uh, who do we need to read up on and and look out for? Um, Andrew Ehrenberg was my um, doctoral supervisor. It was research on consumer choice processes, brand choice processes. Andrew, of course, uh, in, in the name of Ehrenberg, there's the Bass Ehrenberg Institute where, where of course, Baron Sharp yeah. works and has revolutionized uh, marketing. And that came from Andrew's extraordinary 
work in the 50s and 60s, looking at AGB, a consumer panel data, and discovering, in a sense, the errors of marketing th theory, as it had been taught to me at the Wharton School. I mean, uh, Andrew pretty much single-handedly showed that market segmentation and brand positioning and consumer loyalty are figments uh, of the imagination, of the academic imagination. And of course, Baron Sharp has, has picked that up along with others like Les Burnett and so on, and many of the other key behavioral scientists working in, uh, in, in marketing and, and behavior generally. Andrew was remarkable. He was a scholar, quiet, modest, but deeply human and hugely helpful. And I suppose he's the, the most gifted intellectual I've ever worked with. Uh, so yes, he's a hero of mine as well. I wonder who your heroes are, Chris. Apart from you, Jules. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a tricky question. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. I, I, I definitely adore Rory and yes. I, I love his... I think it's his curiosity which yes. which I love the most um in in that he just seems to know a little about a lot yeah. um, which I think is always very helpful and then I yeah, where they, he gets his where does he get his ideas he he writes this wonderful fortnightly column mm, in the spectator. spectator many of you probably will read it and it ranges over a huge spectrum of human behavior mm. and spots something genuinely interesting and brings a, a, a really novel insight to bear how does because that would be lovely to have wouldn't it, it yeah i think that there's a couple of ways that that i know that he does it um because i've because i've seen him when, when i was working with him but what, one of the ways was he he does rely a lot on the people that surround him yeah I mean, he's lucky enough to be you know probably one of the you know 10 people working in advertising who's over 40 um <laughs> surrounded by yeah. by a lot of a 28 lot, year olds yeah, yeah a lot of 28 year old curious people who are learning about all sorts of stuff so yeah. and he's he's always you know you you and I and probably most other people on this call will know him from doing talks and you almost can't stop him from talking yeah. but when you see him just day to day at work he's mostly listening um he sits down and he just he would listen to Dan Bennett and he'll listen to the other team that are in the in the Babel Science team a lot. So he does spend a huge amount of time doing that. And they'll mention academic papers and I'll see him writing writing down notes and then he'll go off and read up on them. And then I think it's the same with with people like you, because I know that you you chat with him every now and then. He he love he's very good at keeping in touch with other people from quite disparate fields. Um and then the same thing, I've seen him and heard him in these conversations. He'll have lunch at Ogilvy and uh, with, you know, yourself or other other friends of his. And, yeah. and then again, he'll go away and start reading up on stuff. And I think because he's got this diverse mix of friends and and is a very good listener is, and is naturally very curious and has access to the Internet, um, <laughs> he then uh, does a lot of reading up and draws these these connections, which most of us wouldn't see. I mean, he's also a very creative, imaginative person. So, um, I... The connectedness um, in the Maverick book, we call it resourcefulness. That is trying to find a network that's, you know, weakly linked. Don't mm. rely just on those you're working with and your close friends. Try and find different groups seeing the world very differently and mm -hmm. having one link to such a group uh, can be hugely educative we're more educated I think by our friends than we ever are by our teachers and therefore as the guest saying goes choose your friends carefully but choose your friends as you say Chris from a wonderfully diverse network because the art of living I think is to see the world through others eyes and to have that skill of mentalization it's mm. partly empathy, but it's also imagining what the world might be like starting from a different place or coming from a different place. Mm. I agree. 
I mean, yeah, my my other hero is 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 is, a, is the soppy emotional woman. It's probably my dad. He's a he's a a, a crazy eccentric uh, uh, photographer inventor. Yes. I think I don't know. I mean, Jake you, you knew him a bit as well. But he's always been very positive and sort of you know the the cup wasn't half full; it was overflowing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's he'd he's be definitely... inventing a new cup. Yeah. <laughs> and a new liquid to fill it yeah exactly <laughs> um, yeah he's he's definitely a that expression a, a radiator not a not a drain yep. um, yeah um i mean he wonderful. gives out so much more than uh-huh. he takes i think that's a another important quality of, of people like rory is you know they give yeah. so much more than than they take um yeah i, I don't know whether right. kindness is the right word but yeah it's... yes i it's quite important to know how we're experienced by others. Peter Drucker, I suppose the, the greatest thinker of, on management, almost invented the modern theory of management. He used to say that the, the most important conversation at work is to ask others, how do I need to change if I'm to help you bring the best out in yourselves? And of course, it's a difficult question to ask, and it's a very difficult question to answer. So it needs to be asked carefully and probably over, you know, a couple of weeks and of course when the, you've got the answers you now have the right to say look if you want me to change in this way to bring the best out in you I need you to change in the following ways to enable me to be to change in the, in the way you would like me yeah. to change and I think those conversations those reciprocal conversations are very powerful I don't know whether as a father he had those kinds of conversations with you Chris but I suspect he was a very good inquisitive questioner of you as a kid and not just, um, you know, an instructor. But yeah, he would have yeah. brought out your own curiosity, I suspect. No, 100%. Um, yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that. But, yeah, good observation. Um, <laughs> I saw there was, a, there was a question from Marissa. Yes, I'm just um, going to bring in Marissa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris and Jake. <laughs> I'll just take you out of uh, the spotlight and we'll bring in uh, Marissa. Uh, hello. hello. Can you Marissa. hear me? We can. Um, and fun you're is chasing very around the welcome house. Oh, joining us today. You had a lovely question in the chat for Jules, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, Jules, this is lovely to hear. Thank you. And I just, it's, I'm struck by, you've obviously moved around and experienced life around the world to whatever degree. And I was just wondering how essential you think it is to have those perspectives, because I think, you know, obviously America in the sort of 60s or early 70s is obviously, I could imagine that was very informative. And then France rather is, has a very different ethos and way of thinking in life. I thought, you know, how much do you think it's, it's crucial to get those various perspectives? That's a lovely question. Thank you, Marissa. I like the phrase new latitudes, new attitudes. I think we learn best when we're at the edge of our experience, Um, perhaps when we're surprised. My teaching career, certainly since the year 2000, has been to take quite small groups to foreign cities and go into what might be called the darker side of the city, uh, prisons, uh, care centres, places where people are suffering or where people see the world through different eyes, perhaps less fortunate than we are, and in very small groups, possibly one-on-one, have conversations. So groups no bigger than three or four in a city like, I don't know, Hyderabad, uh, Cape Town, or the uh, informal community next to Kailisha, I think it's called, isn't it? The informal community in Cape Town, or um, or the, the darker side of Boston and so on. Um, Sorry, I'm laughing because I used to work in the 19th in Paris, and that sort of feels like that to me. That's <laughs> well, yes, I'm in the I, I'm in the ninth at the moment. I'm going to well, a that's Bob better, Dylan, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to a Bob Dylan concert tonight in in oh. Paris. You you can see behind me is this little hotel room, a small hotel. It looks um, chic. <laughs> it's very chic, the Rue, Rue Berger. And I, I'm lovely. laughing because I said to Jules, do you think we'll be able to work into the conversation that you're going to see Bob Dylan tonight? So he's very artfully brought that in. That should be mentioned at all times, yeah. <laughs> my favourite Dylan song 
is every grain of sand do any of you know that song so it's the song he sang i guess in his 40s which is more than 40 years ago of course which records if you like his his conversion to christianity a, a moment of dwelling on the extraordinary mystery of the world and so on that the world is contained in a grain of sand he's promised to sing that tonight uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm here to <laughs> go to that concert with 10 mates. But Marissa, your question is about perspectives. And I think that I think I brought my children up to have um, a multilinguistic education. So the kids went through the French system uh, as well as English schools and so on. And I think it, we know that creativity is hugely aided when we uh, are multilingual, uh, or when we have experiences of different cultures, and we see everything in relative terms. In other words, we, we have a way of looking at the culture into which we were born through the eyes of others who were born in different cultures. And it's the connection between this connectedness, as both you and Chris have called it, as well as the creativity and curiosity that goes alongside that. Uh, it's like taking holidays, go to places that are fresh, go to places, go, what was the lovely phrase, take the, the road less traveled, uh, the famous poem. The road less traveled is a good road to take, isn't it? Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you for joining us. And as you say, Jules, it is so important to have a different perspective in order to see but it's not easy is it my dad was just telling me a story when he worked on one of the major <clears throat> excuse me razor blade manufacturing accounts and his image of when men had a shave was getting up in the morning you shave and you put on your suit and what he then discovered was actually that 50% of the male population at this time actually shaved in the evening because, of course, not everyone goes to work in a suit. A large proportion do other types of jobs. And it's when they come home in the evening to get ready to go out that they shave. And I think it really made me think about how hard it is to get away from our biased view of the world. I, um, yes, I was in Houston with a, a medical equipment manufacturer recently. I think they made heart valves. And a lot of the conversation earlier in the week was about how they needed to change the design of the heart valve to make it more successful, to make it more popular with surgeons. And at the end of the week, we visited the operating theater in a famous Houston hospital and talked to the operating team, including the nurses. And we discovered that it's not the surgeon that chooses the make of heart valve, it's one of the senior nurses. And in talking to the nurses, we found that she loved the box it came in because the box was perfect <laughs> for her. She was a knitter and it was perfect for putting the yarn in, in an ordered fashion. So she had all these boxes, all labeled by colors of different kinds of yarn. And that was the basis upon which <laughs> this famous Houston hospital bought their heart valve and nobody else's. That's and of course, the world amazing. is made up of these lovely surprises. How do we notice this stuff? Yeah, that's just an amazing story. I mean, before uh, everyone joined us on this call, we were talking about one particular part of the course where you talk about creating your vision, creating the mission, your values. And now I'm reflecting on that and thinking, how can we create these clear visions when, as you say, <laughs> we're, not, we're not seeing 90% of the picture, how how possibly our users, our customers, whatever word you want to use, you know, how they see the world. Yes. I think part of it comes from knowing whom we are. Bronnie Ware, who is a palliative nurse, she wrote a famous book, many of you will know it, uh, The Regrets of the Dying. She listened in on many family conversations um, towards the end of the life of a father or a mother or a brother or what have you. And she listened for those things that um, 
towards the end of our lives, you most regret. And of course, the famous one is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Um, but the one she found accounted for more than any other regret was, I wished I'd lived a life of my own choosing and not the life that others chose for me. And I think when we give ourselves permission to be ourselves, we're more likely to notice those curious things outside of ourselves. When we're comfortable within, there's a kind of, what is it? A uniformity between the person we are and the person we'd like to be. I think the external world is seen more clearly perhaps. So we notice surprise, we're more engaged aged with the external world because the internal world is relatively well ordered. In fact, I think that's probably a Freudian insight as well. Uh, I think that's important. I think that is important. Maybe by being more yourself and true to yourself, as people uh, like to say these days, you then free yourself up to ask the questions. I'm actually just thinking now of uh, the way that Rory in his recent exploration of transport seemed in reflection to be just asking such simple questions. You know, why is it that we can't look for comfort on the train? Why is it that the most basic request of just wanting to know more about the reason why we've stopped as opposed to the engineer or the economist approach, which is just pack as many on, get them there as fast as possible. And he'd yes. argue we don't need necessarily to be getting there so quickly we'd rather be in comfort and aware of what's going on and maybe our thinking frame becomes more open when we are more consciously ourselves and see things you in put a more it brilliantly. real way our agenda should be the questions to which we want answers and if we were to have answers would contribute hugely, not only to our own happiness, but to the happiness of others. I think that the corporate plan should not be made up of numbers, objectives, targets, KPIs. I think it should simply be a statement to the questions to which we want answers, because experimentation always begins with the question to which we have, to which the hypothesis or the hypotheses are the potential answers. Managers are very good at delivering on an objective or answering a question. And therefore it's very important we start, so to speak, with the right question. If we start with the wrong question, we will answer the wrong question and performance will suffer. And I think many companies are, are, are getting to a brilliant answer to the wrong question. It's better to have a crappy answer to the right question than a brilliant answer to the wrong question. And that's why everything needs to begin, I think, with what is the issue at hand? I mean, it's true, I think, of Britain at the moment. I think post-Brexit Britain, post-pandemic Britain. What are the two or three questions to which we want to find answers? I'm not sure we have that agenda even. It's got very uh, philosophical, as we knew it would do with somebody as much a deep thinker as yourself. Uh, Jules, I've just seen another question has popped up that yeah. I think we would like to bring in, if you don't mind, Nick. Uh, would you like to join us to put your question to Jules? Um, you were asking a question about the darker side of leadership. I'll just bring you in. Hello, Nick. You're very Hello, welcome. Nick. Thank yeah. you for Hello, joining Jules. us. Hello, guys. Hey, Chris. Hey, guys. Um, hi, Jules. You mentioned early on that you take your students off to the darker sides of uh, the cities and, and to kind of take a look at the leadership. And I'm just thinking now, because you mentioned Bob, yeah, Bob, uh, Bob Dylan, because he talks a lot about good and evil and, you know, yes. the whole dichotomy of his writing. But it's yes. actually pretty interesting. Like, uh, would you find that leadership is a bit different in the darker side what you know whatever that is versus about that because you talk about the egalitarian sort of thing of like you know in a work space should you know should be like this but would because do you find that leadership is different in in our in a harsher environment and is that is there some commonality between that darker side and that lighter side for lack of a better term to put yes it gosh way. yes i think it's more likely to be more human i think where 
where we're dealing with um, the less fortunate and those who choose to care for the less fortunate. It may be a teacher in an underprivileged school, you notice immediately the difference. It's a, genuinely, it's a genuine attention to the other person, the child. Um, and it's, it feels to me more authentic, braver, uh, quite courageous. Uh, it's more outgoing. It, it, it's less egotistical. There's no showing off. Mm. Um, and that that could be profoundly moving. I think the the spirit of these discovery experiences, these creative encounters, is not simply to learn from others or treat, for example, a caregiver as an exemplar of of, of leadership, but it promotes much more honest human conversation over a nice dinner that evening, possibly with a very nice wine amongst, if you like, the managers I'm with. They, you can't, after an experience like that, talk, you know, bullshit. It, it has to be human and real. It's about life. It's the kind of conversation you might have with your children after a week like this, where you take back to your kids something that meant something to you emotionally. You know, when we look back on an experience, we remember what we felt much more powerfully than what we thought. And I think education is about promoting those, those feelings as much, uh, this is a Rory point of view as well, of course, as well as simply an intellectual breakthrough. It's something about educating the heart as well as the mind. And when the heart is being educated, we open up to one another and we say the things that need to be said. I was with Danon, yesterday at INSEAD in, in Fontainebleau and Danon's going through a terrible patch at the moment. And I was hugely encouraged by the wonderfully candid conversations they were having with one another. And that was partly because they'd been on farms the, uh, the day before with, with, with farmers producing the milk for the yogurt and so on. It made it more real. They were in contact with those who you know, live difficult lives supporting a firm like Danone. I think that's the difference. I love your question. You're all you're asking questions to which it's not easy to, yeah. to give a yeah. good answer. Yeah. I've got a follow-up one also. So the, the follow-up one is basically, would, yeah, would, yeah, would you say that if there's good leadership in one sort of whole area or sector, would, would that have a knock-on effect to another area and sector? So as you say, if a lot of us change our leadership sort of styles and, and, we, and we talk about like, if because uh, if only corporates were a bit like like a Birdsock, you know, that company, you know, if, if all companies were like that, and uh, well, would that have an effect on other companies and other spaces, those darker I sides? I think so, yes. I think it's nice to have a mix of styles. I think it's nice to import styles that were, you know, bred in one culture and brought into a new culture. I think all of us like to be led by slightly eccentric leaders, by um, my mavericks in a way, who see the world differently uh, and who lead through conversation and different perspectives. And I think in, in a setting where it's a bit more if it's a bit less predictable, we discover fresh sides of ourselves in a way. It's an opportunity to explore something in ourselves that hasn't yet found expression. Because, you know, the so-called 3D model of, of, of personal identity, destiny, drama, and deliberation. Destiny is, is our genes in some sense, the person we were meant to be. Drama are the events the major events in our life that shake us up and force us to adapt and so on. And deliberation, of course, is the choices we make as to the kind of person we should become. And I think the way you describe the crossover is, is a kind of set of events which stimulate our deliberation, if you see what I mean. Mm. Thank cool. you so much, Thank Nick. You. Really great question. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. And we're coming towards the end of this speaker event, Jules, and whilst we're talking about um, the styles of leadership, <clears throat> I wonder if you recall the story you told actually in the course, a way in which uh, it was, I suppose, to facilitate staff to be more 
uh, honest about whether they thought things were successful. You told a story about, I think it was a bank that created an internal stock market and the employees yes. bought and sold initiatives. Do you remember that story, Jules? Yes, I, th I think it was Lloyds Bank. They, um, they, I suppose, had, like many large corporations, more than 100 separate initiatives that they were kicking off at various levels in the, in the company. And the board had a very clear view as to the value that they attached, uh, the prices, if you like, the stock prices they were putting on these different initiatives. And the suggestion was that they should have an internal stock market. I think they gave everyone paper money. So they gave everyone, all employees, uh, 10,000 uh, pounds paper money to invest in those initiatives uh, that they believed to be underpriced by the board. In other words, they do better than the board thought they would do and uh, and not and avoid investing, so to speak, in those initiatives that they thought were overpriced. So you've produced, if you like, some crowd wisdom in the way that initiatives are, are priced by all employees rather than just the board. And of course, the prices of the initiatives change radically as a result of this internal uh, stock market. And of course, then the question arises, who has the better insight as to which of these initiatives are going to create value for Lloyds Bank uh, than the others? Is it the board of eight or is it the entire employee population of 100,000? And of course, most theory, I'm sure Rory would say, the 100,000 are more likely to be pricing those initiatives correctly. And I think that was a, a very interesting way of in a sense distributing influence within a firm the other much more recent internal market that i saw was ibm it's called ibm fund it it's for part of ibm i'm not sure which part but they've given everybody twenty thousand dollars to invest in their in their own initiative with no permission required they can invest that twenty thousand where they think it would create the greatest uh, impact on IBM's bottom line, on IBM's future. But you can only invest it if two others within IBM, with their own 20,000, prefer your idea to their idea and link their 20,000s to make 60,000. And then you can go with it. So it's a team of three with 60,000, all with one initiative, one thought. I think that's a very, very powerful model. That will produce much greater wealth, I think, than some top-down initiative from an aging board who have become fearful. That's just a fantastic story. And thanks for sharing the early one. And of course, you know, the theme that seems to be coming through all of this is that you're the power of these experimental mm. ideas. Absolutely love them. Well, as I say, we are coming towards the end of the session and just to ask you Jules is there anything that you would like to leave everyone who joined us today a, a parting message for everyone who took the time to join us this Thursday oh, afternoon one parting message I wish you were with me this evening we could go to a Bob Dylan concert all together and then have a lovely French meal <laughs> after it but uh, there will be opportunities I'm sure to beat up no give yourself permission later in the evening, no more than 20 minutes, just to reflect on everything we've been talking about and form perhaps two or three ideas of your own. It's often in those silent moments, isn't it? Where we come up with a, a hypothesis or two of our own or experiment you'd love to work on in your own workplace. Uh, we, are, we live such busy lives, don't we? The, the, the ability to step back, slow down, I think it was Julia Birchall who said most of us would do our jobs better if we did them less. And I think that notion of a quieter life, a more reflective life, but when we're acting, we're acting on, so to speak, a considered or a highly imaginative thought that's come into our mind. So thank you all so much for, for spending uh, this hour all together appreciate it hugely and I hope we have an opportunity before too long uh, to meet up again thank you all thank you thank you so much Jules thank you for joining us it's just been a joy learning from you hearing you speak thank you to everyone who joined us today 
the gang from 42 courses and of course all of our superb subscribers uh you'll find jewels in the creative leadership course and i hope that you will join us again for another event thank you very much everybody and goodbye thank you thank you Louise. bye bye